Hello, everyone. Hey, Mario. Okay, cool. Uh, where are we at? Plan weekly sync. 30th of January, 2023. Um, Petro, you have the first point. Um, yes, yes, yes. I were interested in to dive in deeper into current objectives for the uh, plan stage and maybe product planning uh, team uh, and key results, obviously, uh, to understand uh, and have a context. Uh, it's maybe a part of my context addi addiction, not something uh, I really need for my day-by-day -day tasks, but still asking this question to have an understanding whether is uh, available, whether is not, and what our actions in there. Yeah, good question. So for the full context, uh, we were using a service called ally.io for those. And that was fully private, although we could embed OKRs in our team pages. If we wanted to, we could use an embed code to do that. Uh, we're obviously moving to GitLab for this uh, in Q1. Um, that GitLab group that we're using or the project is under GitLab.com, which is unfortunately only available to uh, full-time team members because of, um, well, it's likely to be because of, uh, you would require like, a lot of compliance training and so on, insider trading stuff, because there'd be information in that group that would be sensitive. So what I'm suggesting is that instead, I'll do a roundup of engineering's Q4 OKRs next week. Uh, the quarter's not quite over yet. It finishes tomorrow, end of tomorrow. Um, and then I'll also share the drafts that we have for Q1 engineering OKRs as well. And that way you'll at least have some idea of what they are, and then you can work directly with um, your point of contact. Uh, in GitLab to which is Kushal to see how you can contribute directly to those. Um, maybe somebody on the product side could do it with product OKRs as well. Does that sound fair? Yes, yes, super reasonable. Thank you. No problem. Cool. I'll take a follow up from that. Uh, I have the next point. So. Yeah, it's just a reminder that the 15.8 retrospective is live currently. We're also working on a deliberately compressed timeline with our retrospectives now, just because they tended in the past to kind of bleed into each other. And we were just, we always had an open retrospective. So now we have a timeline for it. And the timeline for feedback realistically is about one week. Um, this is the release that we introduced OKRs. So I'm really hopeful that we'll get a lot of feedback from everyone about what that experience was like, how we could have improved, what we did well, and so on. Um, it's also the second uh, major work item type that we've released. So there might be, you know, correlations or things that we did both times that we want to keep doing or that we're starting to see patterns that we might want to change. So yeah, it's just a reminder to please take some time, think about what feedback you might have and to drop it in that issue. Um, I mentioned here as well that uh, there was an async retro into tasks at the time uh, that didn't really get traction then. So this might be the opportunity to kind of revisit that and, you know, see what the, like I said, the correlations between those two work items. Like if we were to in introduce a third work item, what would we do differently that we did those two times? Um, and yeah, the basically like the due date for collecting feedback is Friday because um, I think the timeline is that by the fourth or fifth, we would wrap this up and, um, start to take corrective actions and so on. Um, yeah, like I, I mentioned why that was. Yeah, over to Gabe. Uh, yeah, uh, I just, this is a FYI, open MR for January direction page updates for project management categories. I was just going to call out based on our sync that we had uh, last week with EMPM across different stages. We made some decisions specifically that project management would focus on migrating issues to namespace groups in Q1 to better set up epics and prog playing to be migrated uh, in Q2. So that's the only shift from that document that we reviewed and I codified that in this MR. I also would love feedback, collaboration input from engineers across the stage and particularly in project management. So if you want to be involved in helping craft the direction or speak into it, uh, provide feedback, uh, ask questions, 
I will leave the EMR open uh, through the end of the week. Thanks. Uh, Petro, you're next. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So I were going to do a small uh, local demo of uh, reordering, manual reordering, and got a <clears throat> last-minute problem. Sorry for that. Anyway, it will be available on the merge request, and uh, what I were looking for were just an early feedback uh, because, you know, <laughs> widget, and work item hierarchy and all that things are uh, interesting and challenging. But uh, nevertheless, the next point is exactly about the same process. And uh, I would ask for the inputs regarding uh, changing type of uh, work item. Uh, we already we decided to scope it uh, for for this iteration to be just object key result to objective uh, change or promotion uh, rather rather change and uh, I want to have a vertical slicing to have smaller merge requests uh, for uh, fast feedback. And uh, I see that a lot of different uh, concepts are mixed in the discussions. Um, what I would ask to focus on is just a backend uh, terminology. And what I'm going to do is try introduce uh, universal GraphQL interface, which under the hood uses some small and fast to deliver uh, maybe issuables framework mechanics where we do uh, creating new work item and removing previous one, like uh, when promoting issues to the epics. Uh, it, it may work for a uh, first step, but anyway, I want to have some clear interface which will not require changes in the future graphql interface that was my my question and i would love to hear inputs from others i think i had the first item and um <clears throat> this isn't back end specific but i think it will impact the back end so in that roundabout way uh our current promote issue to epic experience is clunky and not ideal and i i read through some of the discussions and it looks like we're not going to try to recreate that same thing or we close the issue create a new epic we it's just like a hard we want to change the type um and i think it, i love that it's being scoped to just objections and key results i'm cool it's like limiting the the scope of it but just uh i had concerns about introducing the promotion language uh that is user facing because i don't think it's a scalable term uh to reflect the future of what we want changing types to be um, because you can promote to a parent but then if we do that then we're gonna have to add like demote to a child or what happens when you change a type that's in the same hierarchy level like uh, I don't know an issue to a bug right uh, promote doesn't really fit that concept um, and so there's just two things one let's not fast follow the issue epic pattern with duplicating and creating clone resources but then also to just what we call it that's what I said. So I think Amanda, you're next. Yeah. Um before we before we move on to this kind of front end decision, did anybody want to talk about Pedro's question from the back end perspective, or should we sort this out first? Yeah, I, okay. I well the bigger question is how should it like do do we know what are the restrictions when we talk about uh, changing types? Because that is that, that's what is going to shape how the backend is going to be implemented or what we need to implement on the backend. Like, do we know okay. clear definition or somewhat clear definition of what we want to implement in terms of changing types? 
because I, like I, I've left a comment below that were like mm -hmm. I guess you get to a point where you have a type that cannot be changed to another one anymore or at least there will be some situations like that um can we give some generic rules around when would that happen so that we can implement it more generically on the back end and not have to implement it for very specific types because like eventually we will not have the notion about a type per se all we will know about is it has this set of uh, widgets. Sure. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think um, we are trying to make the problem smaller by choosing one known kind of use case, which is KRs being promoted to objectives. Um, because one, it's a, it's a common, I think, use case in the OKR world. Um, and two, it's one of the lower complicated kind of um, processes from a backend perspective. But to your point, I suppose you want to know the bigger picture so that you can build something that's scalable for everything. Um, yeah, there will so be. Like, instead of like doing this for OKR, for key results promoting to objectives, can we generalize uh -huh. it to say, like move from child to parent is something that we will basically al always want. So then we don't have to implement Understood. it. Understood. We can implement it. Understood. Now. Sure. Yeah. And I think that moving the child to parent is something that we're definitely going to want. I think there's little restrictions um, there. Ch we will want, in some cases, parent to child. For example, if I'm going to use the OKRs, um, we would want to be able to let somebody change an objective to a child care. But there are things that we have to consider. If that parent has, ch has child records associated with it, right, what should we do? Um, some things that we started talking about, Alexis and I, in that um, in that conversation would be like the first uh, very simple, boring solution would be to not allow it. If that parent has related children records, don't allow it, pop a message, say, reparent those children, and then you could do it. But long term, I'm not sure what that answer should be. That would be something that I'd like UX to explore to figure out what the right usability is. That said, I don't want to block progress here, right? So what's the best way to move forward? Gabe, I think your point is valid. Introducing two different things that overlap will be confusing. I, I ultimately decided to go with the promoting because of the parity, but to your point, that shouldn't be the only reason why we make the decision. So I think it's fair. Yeah, I think oh, it's great to scope it, scope it to this. I was just gonna say, suggest like, just have a drop down that has a type that you can change it to and have it that's it don't even like have change anything just have like type be a field or a widget and then you can change it to whatever you want to be and scope it just to objectives and key results because you're right it is a small it's a known thing and you don't have to answer all the problems but it's not introducing like because my fear is if we go with the promotion thing it'll be we're going to introduce a quick action to like promote right and then we're going to like introduce all this other stuff that we're not going to want later on and so if you still think it's like the best thing to do i mean i'm totally going to support you i just wanted to make sure that we thought about the long-term implications of adding and then having to remove things from the UI from an end user perspective. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, Alexis, did you have any feedback? Did I misspeak at all? No, no, I think that makes sense to me. And I've seen that in a lot of products that are actually mature where it's just like you say change to it, it just doesn't allow you to do that, things like that. So I think that, like you said, we can keep thinking about those kind of um, other cases there, but for now, I'm okay with changing to like change type, convert type. I've seen things like that. I think that's fine. Is Nick on? Nick Leonard? Oh yeah, you are. Yeah. Sorry. Hey. Yeah. That was, I mean, that, I think that's kind of my point was just, uh, we don't actually have to do anything different from a behavioral perspective, but if we kind of think of it in that sense, we could sort of put us on the same path we would be as opposed to, you know, introducing promote and then saying, never mind promotes change. Well then, uh, I'm returning in my thoughts to the initial question, uh, which is for for this week for my backend uh, work item uh, and changing type. Uh, I'd rather uh, try to not introduce new widget whenever it is called uh, on on backend side. 
uh, but rather use existing update, GraphQL mutation, and a simple uh, fork item type field in this update as possible. And then uh, under the hood, so we can handle it case by case if we need it. And now uh, changing work item type from key result to objective uh, should be super simple, super fast, and super deliverable. Uh, not, not, not <clears throat> I see no rocket science in there. Uh, that's it for my question. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, I, don't think we need, I don't think we need a widget for that because that's probably not going to be something configurable in any way. You, you, you'll, you're going to have it at pretty much on every work item. So that should not be a new read. That should be pretty much the same as the title, I would say. And that's probably the only other attribute or field that, that's going to behave that way. At least that's my current understanding of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, my thought as well. Thank you. If just a quick question, because I don't know how this works. If it is not a widget and it's just like an attribute, like the title, is that easy enough to keep off of whatever work items we don't want to display it on yet? Uh, it is okay. not about displaying at all at this point because it just a GraphQL field and then uh, back. Yeah, no, I mean uh, in the future. Uh, I think that will be driven, like conceptually, that will be driven by the fact, can you change this work item type to anything else? And that will drive okay. the decision if we display it or not. So I guess the initial version would be, um, if it's a, um, I don't know, I don't think we have a work item in the middle, but uh, if it's an objective, you cannot demote it. So there will be, like we can hide it in that case. You don't have work item types to convert this to, so then there is no need to show it, basically, if that makes sense. It does make sense, thank you. Okay. Eventually, as yeah, a so... engineer, uh, I would expect uh, to have a list of work item types we can convert into, and we will fetch it in the initial query and then show and hide. So just extending what Alexander said. Sorry for interrupting. Is that what we would want in the future, though? Because I would expect, uh, like down the line that we can convert to anything. It's just a matter of like, what do you do with the data, right? To get it into the right shape of where it's going. Uh, I don't know if there's like a really strong business reason to have like a lot of rules about what can be converted to what. I think that likely introduces some complexity that might not be needed. Yeah, so that that's where my concern is because we're trying to keep all um all work item type differences within widgets and keep the core um the core logic as generic as possible and if we start introducing a bunch of uh conditionals in the work item core i'm concerned that that's going to keep growing and growing so like if we have a um if we have widget or if we have um uh conversion logic in the main work item uh core that just says like if it's a if it if the work item type is a objective only allow for it to switch to this type it's just going to add like melissa said more complexity to uh to that so i feel like it wouldn't be a problem to add it as a, or it wouldn't be too much added complexity to add it as a widget now, but it could be wrong. It's not that we will go, we are going to tie it to specific types, but like, like the, the question that I was having is like, how do you, like, what type do you convert an objective that has child KRs or something like that? Like, what's the type that you're like, do we know how to convert that? And the, in that case, it just doesn't make sense to show a drop down or a widget to convert the type because like there will be nothing there. You cannot convert it to anything, right? 
um, because it has the yeah. uh, items. I don't know. I think that we need to figure out in the long run, and it absolutely makes sense to limit the scope for now, right, in this initial MVC to, like, only appear in um, objectives or key results, whatever we choose. But I think that we could do with maybe, like, a feature flag or something instead of, like, building logic tied to a type. Uh, with Because we know long-term, we do want to enable that. We just need to figure out how, right? And we just haven't had time to figure out how, but we will, like, schedule that in the future. Does that make sense? I think, like, parent-child relationships could be thought of as kind of an outlier in all the widgets that we have, like, because... Like Donald was saying, like you would have the work item core, which would only really know what widgets that work item type has. Then the widgets themselves would contain all the logic that says, okay, you're converting from a work item type that has start date, due date, and labels. And each one of those widgets would know what to do with its data if it's converting to another type that doesn't have one of those things or has them in a different context, right? And it all makes sense, like because you were converting a work item type that has start date, due date, and labels to one that only has labels. Each start and due date widget can know what to do with its data in that case. Like either it nullifies its data or retains it should it be converted back in the future. It doesn't matter, but it the widget itself would know. But in the case of parent-child relationships, it's very hard to know. Right? Should it carry the children with it? Should if that if that if the next type can have the same children, should it also should should it have the children? Should they be nullified? Should they be also be converted um, to compatible types? So it's like it's just that one widget that is harder to reason about. The rest of them, I think, can be managed very simply. You know, on a one on a widget by widget basis. Am I wrong? Uh I agree with that, but like there is added a complexity. Like as we go, we want to allow configuring the relationships of parent child, right? So that's like that's the vision. You you can define that this type can have these children, and then this subtype can have these children, and so on. So that's that's not something that we can easily kind of code and and say how that will transition. It, it again needs to be. But yeah, I I agree. That that's one thing that's kind of hard to put your finger on and say, well, this is how we, we, we should do it. We would need to run some kind of sort of thought experiments, I think, on that. And like, think about like, what does that mean? Like somebody's converting all their epics to, you know, features like single level features. Does it make sense to just copy over all the issues those epics had? Like probably, like how many of these like valid use cases you know, would make sense just to copy the children, the child types over, you know, and like, cause probably there's no like definite right answer, but there are probably very common things that you want to do or that we'll see in the wild that you could just make a choice. Like whether the children should all be like nullified and you start over by adding them to the newly converted item or whether we can make an assumption that you want them all to be retained know whatever that is running this I, uh, I think in the general case they're going to want to uh, keep them as they are because the, the 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 idea had been that hierarchy can be added to pretty much every work item um so uh they would just carry over you know that's what i would expect as well can, like, can, can can create any any hierarchy of types that they want right yeah, Eventually. like if I have if I have something that came in as a service desk issue, converted to an issue, we added a bunch of tasks, and then I finally decided it's a bug and converted to a bug. I still want all the tasks, right? I don't want to have to create all those again, right? So absolutely, yeah. But it's like what happens when you make that issue that has a bunch of tasks or bugs that has a bunch of tasks an epic? Do you then convert the tasks to issues? I think that's where the, the thought experiment is, but I'll just verbalize my one point I had. I think going back to trying to get the MVC down uh, and wanting to just use uh, generic like update mutations and stuff on the work item, you could just make the little type you know that's in the breadcrumbs uh, drop down that lets you pick the valid type. So for objectives and key results, and just have the option of 
being uh, if it's a key result, that would be something selectable that you could change it then to the objective instead of introducing like a new widget or a bunch of stuff. Um, just because the, the risk is low because it's we haven't generally released OKRs yet, but that's just an idea without doing a bunch of extra design work and stuff. Running this thought experiment in the current context I have objectives and key results. Returning to the point Natalia mentioned about having the um, options to choose from. Uh, and let's say we have a key result which already have some progress percentage set. Uh, if uh, converted to objective, given uh, parent uh, this um, up, up rollout of percentages, it can be kind of hard from backend perspective to re-evaluate all the hierarchy up to the uh, top level uh, objective. When converting it and assigning new parent. So I'm thinking about uh, each key result having another um, field or widget, an array of possible convertible types where, where frontend can choose from. So if uh, the key result has zero as a percentage of completion, then it is convertible to objective. And then it this operation is possible if uh, it has 50 as a percentage, uh, this conversion is not possible. And we will ask user to go remove and create new one and, and do this uh, magic manually. We can't, we can't we can't we, we can't recalculate the progress for something you promote we can i mean we do already have levels deep of objectives and we do roll up like we do have that computation so that should not be really the issue i, I don't think unless i'm missing something here but i'm using this as a, an example uh about why do we need this uh possible type to convert uh field and restrictions as possibly. I, I think we want to attempt to stay away from, from that if we can. The long-term goal, if I remember correctly, is that we do want high flexibility between moving and changing types of items. So if we can come up with a way to not lock into a specific list of items, um, or if we have to do that, calculate it on the fly without having to hard code certain things, then I think that would be better, but I don't know the answer right now. Since we have high level alignment, I would say about the approach is just details that we're talking about. Can we continue the discussion and issue? so that it's all documented and async. Cool, thank you. And thanks Donald for uh, linking the issue there. I think it's on me, right? So it's more of a heads up or announcement. I'm, I'm looking on to move work item functionality through the lens of like sharing it into a different namespace. And then if you unshare it from the original namespace, that's that's when the move happens. But also that also implements the fact of like actually sharing work items. That's a pretty complex concept. <laughs> uh, I would say because it involves sharing also a lot of the work items associations. If you start thinking of like sharing an work item, it has a milestone. Does it share to the next namespace? Um, what if you don't want to share that milestone and so on? So there are a lot of variables there, but yeah, expect that I'll be thinking some of you or all of you uh, for opinions and feedback. I've shared a couple of the issues and the main discussion and a lot of context is in the epic 
the second link there. So if if you want to get up to date with with what's been discussed so far, you can follow that one. And I think we can skip Gabe's points because or I don't know. Uh, Gabe, it's up to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just put a TLDR of why got to like go why the context around why we're talking about this. Um, and I'll just answer Melissa's question in terms of the details. And the the use case here is um, when I've been talking to customers about a roadmap, a lot of the customers, uh, lots of them have issue only projects under their groups, but they do all of their uh, planning at the group level. And so they're very excited about being able to have issues at the group level, get rid of the issues only projects. But they said as part of this, what they want to do is they will move all of their hundreds or thousands of issues from their different project to the group level. And right now, the closing cloning uh, as part of the move process is really undesirable and that it will have like a bunch of duplicates. And then when they do things like global search, you'll have all these like duplicate things that show up there in terms of things that are open and closed and it's the same exact issue and all this confusion. And they said, hey, can you just properly handle moving issues first to where you don't create a copy of it? You just move it. Um, and so I started thinking about that, but then when I was doing the competitive analysis, I also had noticed that, uh, Asana doesn't have the ability to move. And I thought that was interesting, but they don't need it because you can share and then remove projects from groups, which is the same thing as moving. Um, that's sort of where I don't think we're going to be able to address either of these before we move issues to the group level, unless there's a small win, which I'm totally open to doing that as well. Um, but it's more of an exploration in terms of what's the best way to solve this now and also in the long run. Yeah, so this sounds to me like it's not blocking, right? Because you could have issues at the group level before it can move properly, but basically this would make it a better experience after it's available for customers that want to take advantage of it. Is that right? Yes and no. It'll pre it'll it potentially may prevent adoption of using issues in the group for existing customers. If that makes for sense. existing because customers. I because they don't want to go through that pain point of all the duplicates. Mm -hmm. So the I, new I, customers I, I could take advantage of it day one right, <clears throat> without having to move. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to figure out if it's, if it is a blocker or not, I'm not necessarily saying it is. Uh, I think part of the, what we want to determine the spike is if there's something quick that we can do and it may turn out that there's not, in which case we're just going to move on to moving issues to the group level. But I think it is, worthwhile to care about equally new customers and existing customers so yeah that makes Maybe. sense i think it may be the other way around that we may want to have issues at the group level before we can do the sharing because then you have the sharing between projects and mm -hmm. groups and groups and groups if that makes sense because you have the like once you have the issues at the group level you kind of can share issues between the groups if that makes sense as well right um, yeah Whereas if you if you don't have it, you, you cannot do that. And and there is that transition of the issue from project to the namespace level that also needs to be kind of done before you can do that. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, and that might be a really good solution is like the, the boring solution is if we know how we want to solve it eventually, even just when we launch issues at the group level, put a disclaimer or a note in the doc to say, hey, in the future, you can move all of your you know, easily move all of your uh, project level issues at the group without duplicating them. And that way they can just start creating their new issues at the group level. And um, I think that's something we should think through of like, like what's the smallest thing we can do. And if that is the right order of operations, how to kind of guide the user along the, the happy yeah. path. When, that was when, exactly when... where I was coming from, Gabe, for my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one possible suggestion. Typically a move is considered a a copy, verify integrity, and then delete. So is it not possible to do the move the way we usually do? And if they've set a flag or whatever, then we delete the duplicate that was there? So seems like yeah. seems like one of the reasons we keep the duplicate is for for a link resolution that's already out in the field, right? That's one of them. The other is that there are a lot of things that are missing from the move service right now that aren't properly handled when moving. So like participants don't get copied. There's a bunch of other fields that don't. I think there's a problem with how weights and stuff like that, uh, um, resource state events, 
label events, designs. milestone events, uh, designs. There's like a lot of things that aren't included in the move service, right? Which is why NBC, I like- yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's not, that's not going to be solved by the pure share functionality because you, you need to have that transition anyway. Like you need to implement it. The, the fact that the code is buggy and doesn't copy over a lot of this stuff doesn't mean that implementing the share will solve it. It's just another way to look at the problem, if you will. Like it's it's a different concept. Like the copy delete is is one concept, and the share is a totally different concept. At least in 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 my in my perception of how I see it. Right. It's one thing to to get the data from here and move it there, clean it up, whatever you need to do. Versus sharing, having two copies, and then at some point, like you, you remove some of the links. It, it's totally has different ramifications. You can share with multiple namespaces. You cannot move it to multiple namespaces, and so on and so forth. It, it, it keeps going. Sharing is a link in an issue list, right? It's a like a sim link, uh, the equivalent of a sim link in Linux or something. It's literally like a point pointer to the yes. original issue. Yes, yeah, but uh, slightly a little more complex. <laughs> well, well, but, yeah, I would read read over the. I think I detailed the happy path pretty well, and the the share and issue to epic uh, issue. And I think we can talk about offline because I would love to see Vitaly's demo. Um, so, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm I I have to read it too. I'm not sure how that would solve the duplicate issue problem because if you're sharing issues up a level then you know you do a search and you're going to find them at the upper level and you're still going to find them at the lower level based on the sharing it's it would seem only, like yeah i mean there should theoretically be only one and the the <laughs> that you sort of have an owner but um it's interesting either way natalia i think it's on you now the demo time. Okay, yeah. let me share my screen and hope that GDK won't fail me. So uh, this is the merge request for threads. It didn't hit the production yet, it's in Canary. So hopefully it will be deployed to prod today. And it changes a few things. First and foremost, it adds the ability to see the discussion and add more commands to the discussion. But also visually, it changes our old ugly refetch that you probably have seen with the skeleton loader with a nice cache update. And it's almost immediate. Now the functionality is really similar to issues. So if we go here, you'll see that it's out for a second and then appears here. So it's not fully optimistic update, but the UI is very similar. It's preserved here, and despite the fact it looks very simple, it involved a few complicated things on the front end and a bit on back end. Thanks to Alexandra for fixing the discussion ID so fast. Because previously, when we had one node and we changed to the discussion, we changed the ID of the discussion, and automatic updates were not there. But I think this looks much better, much more interactive than we had it previously. That's it for the demo. Uh, a voiceover. Yeah, I'm excited for this. Uh, I found myself missing threads when I was working on OKRs uh, in the discussion. So that's definitely a feature that I discovered I use a lot. And a lot of other competitors don't have threads within comments and issues. So just so y'all know, it's like a good workflow thing. Uh, and I really enjoyed that it's rich text by default. So uh, thanks for updating the experience as we go. And this this looks much cleaner to the threads. So it's nice to see uh, not only functionality being added to work items, but improved from the old experience. So that's awesome. All thanks go to Deepika and Alexandro. I was only a review and maintainer and like dropping the general suggestions there. It's not fully functional yet. We don't have the functionality to delete the node, uh, neither edit the node, but it's a nice small change, I believe. Yeah, this is amazing. Are we targeting to release this on tasks uh, generally um, in 15.9? Uh, we're going to release whatever's ready. So, <laughs> yeah. 
there are, there are a couple of things that are ready to go on tap that we can't release yet, like iterations of milestones, just because we have to f figure out how to handle proving duplication on report views for time boxes. But anything that's good, we're gonna put in the release post. So if engineers say, "Hey, yeah, this is this meets our definition of done done," it's going in. Yeah. So I believe it's it's behind whatever um, whatever feature flag uh, just general discussions um, are in, in, which I believe is MBC. Actually, it might be. It might be available on all of gitlab.com once it hits production. So yes, discussions will be in uh, in 59 on test. Do we need an issue to enable for OKRs or? No, that should get it automatically um, at the same time. We're not using a separate feature flag for OKR. So any feature or any group, um, or sorry, any project that has OKRs enabled will get everything that we enable for tasks for all of GitLab.com. Um, I'm assuming you're cool with that, Amanda. If you're not, let me know. But I think it's pretty like fallen that we can make global efficiencies all work type types. That simple changes. No, I'm definitely in. Thanks. That's pretty awesome. Is it fair to say that we're not going to try to replace things like the real time changes endpoint or the slash notes endpoint that are pulled on? legacy on the legacy issue view currently given that we're building it into work items and issues will be a work item type sometime soon that's definitely the uh the preference um there are some things i think that we are going in and adding to legacy issues we want to limit that and focus our um, time spent more on um, getting parity on work items with <clears throat> with issues. The day we switch that on, I definitely would like it to be early in the morning, and so I can have my Grafana charts open because I expect like a lot more when we when we create issues as a work item type and then switch that on for everybody. I would expect a lot more data over the wire on the web sockets that we have currently. I expect it will be okay, but um, we slightly worried about a lot of memory bloat from, like, I think at the minute we're mostly, we have a lot of connections, but we're mostly transferring Boolean values over the wire. Um, when we switch this on at scale for everybody who currently uses issues, we sent in a lot of like notes and discussions and markdown text over the wire. So it might be worth just, um, I know it's a it's a way off yet, yeah, but it might be worth just keeping an eye on things, or maybe even yeah, buy some. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was also going to tell you, event. I don't think you need to worry because we're going to do a, like a gradual rollout that's self opt in because you can load the the legacy issue at the legacy issue view route slash issues or at a slash work item with the new UI, and so the working theory right now is that when we get to a point where there is that level of parity, we're going to allow people to hit a button and be like, I want to opt into the new experience, right? And then we're going to measure at least on gitlab.com how many people have opted in to the new experience over time to kind of get a gauge if we've kind of hit that threshold of uh, all the bugs and kinks worked out. So we should be able to do that. And then if anything does go wrong, we can just revert basically the ability for people to opt into that. And they just always get redirected to the, to the legacy view. And I'm pretty sure you could figure out how to do that feature flag. So, um, <clears throat> and Blair, yes, <laughs> all this will go through you, that's for you, promise. Fingers crossed, cross my heart. Cool, looks like we're done. All right. Can I get some agreement? Because last time I thought we were done and I killed the recording and then there was a really good discussion afterwards. So 
I need at least one emoji response before I stop the recording this time. There we go. Yeah, stop it. <laughs>